uh, that would be wrong. Okay. So, oh, let me just quickly say some of the benefits of laughter that will help you as you move into your 35th and your 38th and your 40th year at the University of Oregon. It helps us be more creative, more productive. In fact, if you spend most of your time sitting, which most of us do, your blood and oxygen pools in your backside. I always tell people this is not middle age spread, it's excess oxygen reserves for later <laughs> when I need it. The three most effective way of moving your oxygen back into your brain is running, standing on your head, and laughing. Um, it also helps you be better at working with teams because we appreciate working with people that we have a good time with and people who don't shut down our ideas. It lowers your stress. It improves your immune system. You are working in a cesspool of germs, and you know that, right? <laughs> if anything can improve your immune system, you need to be doing it on a regular basis. So there's hundreds of physiological benefits, but let's just leave it at that. So G, get some funny friends. If you don't already have people who can make you laugh just by walking into a room, you need those people. I, I am lucky, I have a lot of funny friends because when I meet funny people, I stalk them until they cave in <laughs> and agree to be my friend. So one of my funny friends is a guy named Nick. Nick is like, it's a big guy, like six foot three by five foot seven, and, and he now lives in California, and he came up recently, and he took me to Burger King, because I'm a vegan, and he know, knew it would be a cheap date, and we're waiting in line, and the, it's taking forever, there's one cashier, and everybody's complaining at her, like she's intentionally making the meals too slowly, and finally we get up to the front, and she looks at him, and she says, sir, I am so sorry about the weight. He says, honey, I have weighed this much for so long, it really doesn't bother me. <laughs> Managed his stress, her stress, my stress, all of our stress level. I have a friend named Patrice Dotson. She took my stand-up comedy class a while back when she was 78 years old. She took the class because all of her friends had died. That was her reason. Um, and two years later, she participated in the Eugene Laugh-Off, which is my annual comedy event that raises money for Green Hill Humane Society. So far, we've raised over $40,000 with comedy in the past 22 years. And the event is on the 2nd of April if you want tickets. So she comes out there, she basically shaved her head into a mohawk. And she dyed it green. And she came out in her walker. And Patrice mohawks, and she goes like this. But that is not how she got on the stage that day. She really milked it and came out really slow, sat down on her seat, and told really filthy jokes that I will not share with you. But I did take Patrice out for brunch, and she had a tan. This was in February, and I said, Patrice, what's with the tan? And she said, well, I'm on Match.com now. She's 82. And she said, I thought I would look healthier with a fake tan, so I got one of those spray tans. And she said, I, I looked beautiful when I left, but when I got home and I took off my clothes, I realized that certain parts of my body hang in different positions depending on where my arms are. So at one point, I looked like Venetian blinds. <laughs> These are my funny friends, you get your own. <laughs> no, oh, observe your life as a comedy. Everything has the potential to be funny. I had to do stand-up comedy two days after 9-11. I had to do stand-up comedy on the day I lost my first dog, and he was my heart dog. And I would cry just talking about it. My best friend asked me to do her memorial service after dying of cancer comedically in front of a church full of 600 people. I can tell you, there is nothing that you can't find the humor in if you just want to. And it's so good for our survival that you should. So I'm going to tell you a quick little story. It's not sad at all. I was going to Bend, Oregon. I assume most of you have been there. You know there are not enough public bathrooms on the way, but there are plenty of logging roads. <laughs> and I was going to present to the Oregon Librarians Association you all have the wrong idea about library. We're the library people here. You guys are wacky, <laughs> right? Yeah. People think you guys are, but no. And so on the way, I had to heed the call of nature. I did so out of nature up against a big pine tree, got back in the car. I felt kind of a, a, like I had scraped my backside on the tree, but you know, I can't do anything about that. And so I get there, and there's a big line at the buffet, and I'm getting in line with them, and it moves forward, and as it does, I take a step, and when I do, a giant piece of bark falls out of the back of my hand <laughs> and lands on the floor in front of me, and we are all looking at it. And they have no idea what it is. <laughs> I have figured it out. That's what's been causing that weird sensation in the back of my pants. 
And most people would pray for the earth to swallow them whole, and I simply looked up and said, thank God, now if I can just get the squirrel out of my underwear. <laughs> it's a skill. You have it innately. You just need to learn to apply it. So you want to observe your life as a comedy. D, don't ignore your inner five-year-old. The average five-year-old American child laughs 150 to 200 times a day. What do you think it is for grown-ups? Not that. Not that. <laughs> Absolutely not that. It's 15. But do you know why it's that high? Because I am bringing your average up. <laughs> that is not fair to me. They did a study. They followed a thousand American adults around for a week and ticked off any time they laughed. And 40% of them laughed zero to one time a day. That is so sad. 10% of us laugh 90 times or more a day, skewing the mean. So you need to not ignore your inner five-year-old child. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. A woman posted this. It's a true story about her. She wears a burqa, and she's in a store, and a little five-year-old with, with his mother is behind her, and he's just staring at her the whole time, staring at her. And finally they check out and the little boy runs up to her and she has no idea what he might say because he's been, you know, pointing at her and he says, I love you, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to lose your inner five-year-old child. <laughs> you, use your time wisely. If you complain all the time, you're wasting your life. I use the one to five ratio. Every time you complain, you must say five positive things. It's an easy way to stop complaining because you don't have time for five more things. C, comedy equals tragedy plus time. That is a rule in comedy. Most comedians wait a certain amount of time before they try to be funny about something. The longer you wait, the more time you choose to be miserable. Most of the things that you find funny from your life were not funny when they happened, right? So we're going to try to reduce the amount of time it takes before us to find, before we find the comedy in our situations. You can do it immediately. I was at the Hilton in downtown Portland. I had just done a keynote. I was getting ready to do a breakout session. I went to the ladies' room. I closed the stall door. I heard the stall door next to me close, and a woman said, hello. And I thought, well, she's friendly, so I said, hi. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm getting ready for the next presentation. Then she said, you want to come over? And I thought, well, no. <laughs> but I heard her whisper just a little too loudly, I have to hang up my cell phone now. There's a moron in the stall next to me answering all my questions. I, of course, was the moron. And I come out, there's two women drying their hands straight so hard not to laugh. They had turned bright scarlet. What I did is I went immediately to the breakout session and opened with that story to let it go. <laughs> so you have the power to find the humor faster. Um, that was C, comedy was tragedy at this time. K, so we're to uh, kick off a plan to say yes and. I also teach improv. I will say right now the best thing you can ever do in your life is take an improv class. You learn so many things. How to work better as a, with a group of people. How to think on your feet. You get self-confidence. You understand that you don't have to have an idea to put forward an idea. Because we have a rule that's called do, don't think. And it's the opposite of being an adult. And we need to do that sometimes. But the number one rule in improv is called yes and. And imagine if in your work situation, anytime anybody proffered an idea, you said yes and instead of no but, or we call it yes but. Yes but, because our ego always says my idea is better than your idea, so please shut up and let me tell you mine. So yes and means whatever you're given, you build on it and you move forward. It's one of the best pieces of advice anybody ever gave me, and it comes in the form of laughing so hard you are actually rolling on the floor laughing your butt off. That doesn't happen in real life. It does happen in improv class. So kick off a plan to say yes and. Even if you don't take improv class, think about how you can integrate that rule of yes and into your life. And last but not least, ha! it's very fast. Um, you need to stop your ego voices. The majority of our stresses during the day is the voices in our head telling us things that are lies or saying things like, grow up, get serious, act your age, that's not funny. Um, ego stresses are, you know, another gray hair, another argument with a teenager, um, 
anything that is not a life or health emergency. So some of my favorite ways of, oh, I have so many, um, of challenging my ego. I love funny hats. I used to teach a class for Oasis Senior Center. It's at the, the top of the rotunda at Macy's, and it was on a Saturday. And I'd put my hats on, because they love my hats too. I'd put my hat on on the weekend, on a Saturday, and walk through the parking lot with the hat on, through the store, up the escalators, into the rotunda. Like 40 people saw me and pretended that they didn't. <laughs> and I'm always saying to myself, who's the crazy one here? The one who knows she's wearing the hat, or the 40 people going, I don't see her. <laughs> and the last time I came down the escalator past the cosmetic counters where you have those people who are so serious in their white lab coats, like they have PhDs in mascaraology. And I thought, I'm going to make one of their days. So I went up to the Clinique counter and I said, do you have a lipstick that will bring out my bird? <laughs> <laughs> But my favorite is this, because I fly a lot. I wear this in the airport, because you know when you're in the airport, you always are trying to catch your connecting flight, which never connects. And you want people to get out of your way. People get out of my way. Plus, I'm a hot flashing woman who's created my own breeze, and I have a hickey, so it's all good. I'll leave you with just two quick quotes. The one is from Carlos Castaneda who said, we either make ourselves happy or we make ourselves miserable. The amount of work is the same. And if you're carrying around all this stress unnecessarily because you're not able to let it go, you're doing extra work. And the other quote is from Charles Wendell who said, I believe that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Um, and so it is with you. Or you can always follow my advice which is, don't sweat the petty, and don't pet the sweaty either unless you're related to it. Thank you very much.